connecting four different regions across the globe, which are, well, we are here in Amsterdam, then Madrid, then New York, and also Redmond near Seattle. And I'd like to take the opportunity also to, to welcome them and to say hello to them. I'd like to start with Madrid. Uh, hola Madrid. ¿Cómo están ustedes? Hola, hola. You have quite, quite, quite a lot of people there. So are you, do you think you're complete or are there more to come? Well, there's around 50 friends and colleagues there in, in the Microsoft uh, office. Yeah, very nice. Day. Fantastic. So here on the left hand side we have New York. Hello New York, how are you? Hello. Hello. Yeah, New York says hello. It's great to be here on the connected event. Um, wonderful. So use the technology at the same time, different time zones, and we're in this together. Yeah, it's fantastic. And we are we are now on Fifth Avenue is actually on top of the New York flagship store. So it's quite quite a cool location. Locked area there, and I've, I've also my product manager there. You can't see him right now in the pictures of Mr. Parker, but he will have a bigger role later in the presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 and then here on the right, but we have in Redmond, the Microsoft headquarters uh, near Seattle, Warren Fernandez, who is really one of our made contact and uh, we worked on a lot of projects with him. So hi, Warren, how are you? Hi, Birgit. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me. Uh, I wish I could have been there in person, but again, leveraging some of these awesome technologies from Sharp and Microsoft, I'm happy that I'm able to join everyone. Yeah, it's fantastic to have Warren here because it's six, six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning there, so he made, really made the effort to, to be with us, so that's really good. Yeah, so I think now we have said hello, we can, can get it started. And I would like to, to kick this off to tell you a little bit about Sharp, who we are and where we are. And what you can see here is that we have locations all across Europe, but not only across Europe, also all across the globe. So you can be assured that we can look after you very well from everywhere around the world. We are part of the Foxconn group and as such we are able to offer quite a wide range of solutions. So for example there is the document solutions with our multifunctional printers and also um, scanners and there is the visual solutions where we are the leading supplier for corporates for interactive screens in Europe and also in America. And there is also things like managed IT services, which all bring us in a position to um, support the idea of the future office better and to provide and develop solutions for people to live and to work better. That's the ultimate target. And Microsoft is a key partner in this with us because we are working on concepts how to make that happen. And one very good example and this is the centerpiece today, what we're talking about today, is the Windows collaboration display from Sharp, which is the first certified, Microsoft certified, collaboration display in the world, with my kind of path, and we developed that together with Microsoft to make collaboration better, to connect very easily, because it's all about simplicity at the end, to bring your Microsoft 365 and Teams to room scale, but also to make the workplace smarter. And there comes also a software application with it, which is our Sharp Workspaces, where we'd like to talk with you about today. And we have some speakers today that will take you through all the knowledge, through all the findings, through the concepts there. And I'm very looking forward to hear more what Windows Collaboration Display together which Microsoft technologies can do for us. And at this point, I would like to hand over to Michelle Baumer from Microsoft, who will tell us more about Teams. Michelle. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here today. It's a very international event. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. 
Uh, so hi everybody here in uh, in uh, Amsterdam and uh, New York and uh, Spain and of course more to you as well over in uh, in Redmond. Uh, my name is Michel Baumann. I'm one of the territory channel managers specializing in modern workplace here in Microsoft in in the Netherlands. Before I tell you a little bit more about Teams and the advantages of, of Teams, let me start here with Microsoft mission. So at Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Two things that are very powerful to me. One, every person and every organization. Very inclusive, nobody's counted out. That's one. The second one is achieve more. And achieve more is so much more than just doing more. Because doing more is easy. We can determine to work one hour more, sleep one hour less. That's the easy part. Achieving more is something else. Achieving more has something to do with your own KPIs. I can tell you that every minute that I win through technology goes back to what's most important for me, which is my family. Right, so my wife and four kids. Yes, four kids. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, my wife and four kids uh, get all the time that I win through technology. For me, that is what achieving more is. And we're wasting quite a lot of time currently. I mean, if you look at the slide behind me and the research that we conducted, which is called Work Rework, we're, we're spending about 52% of the time on things that are not so relevant to our own KPIs as a company, which we think is very challenging because technology in itself is not a goal. Nobody here has the, the KPI to implement technology as a company. I mean, a real estate agent, their mission is to get as many houses in their portfolio as they can have to make more money off the houses. It's not to buy a device, nor is it to implement a piece of technology. And we have to understand and think about how can we actually make the most out of technology to achieve more as a company. If we double click on meetings, you can ask yourself, are we really getting the most out of meetings? Have we all been in meetings where either somebody came in late? Recognizable, I think. Uh, somebody was on their phone while in the meeting doing whatever they're doing, not being fully present in the, in, the, in the location that they're in. Here at Microsoft in the Netherlands, we have this ritual where we make a conscious decision whether or not we're going into a meeting. For one, we have our meeting duration. So what we're saying is our meetings don't run for 60 minutes, they run for 45. Right? That leaves you with five minutes to wrap up the first the meeting, the meeting that you were just in. Five minutes to do whatever you need to do to refresh, and then five minutes to prepare for the next meeting. It also leads to people make a conscious decision to actually go or not go. If there's no no clear objectives, and there are no gifts and gets for you as a person for that meeting, it's perfectly fine to say I'm not going. If there are, you make the conscious decision to go to that meeting, you're present and you're there. Whether you're dialing in virtually or there in the room. But we do need better tools. Meetings often run over. I think we all we all recognize that one. Uh, people are multitasking, often unprepared. But what we do think is that Microsoft Teams truly helps with this. So Microsoft Teams revolves around these five elements. So the first one is uh, chat. So chat can be one to one or one to many. The second one is meetings. Obviously, this is where Sharp comes in with their beautiful display. You see how we can control, can control meetings in a more functional way. To take more advantage of technology to again reach our own KPIs. The other one is calls. You can call through Teams with your own, uh, your own number uh, through either international common plans or through a functionality that we call direct routing. And of course, all of your files are in the same place, which truly makes Microsoft Teams the hub for teamwork. What we have to think about is how can we actually hack the meeting cycle. So if you look at the meeting life cycle, it's, we all have a before the meeting, so how can we collaborate before we go into a meeting to talk to our peers to discuss what we need to, what objectives we need to meet during the uh, meeting. During the meeting, we can go on. If we're going back to our mission about every person and every organization on the planet, we also try to be very inclusive. So what we also offer is a live caption. You can see live subtitles under the meeting that you're currently uh, present in. I'm noticing that I'm turning on live captions, even if I'm in a meeting, because from a cognitive perspective, I listen so much more engaged when I'm reading these, these objectives. And it also, I mean, the, your meeting notes are 
right there in that in that same space. And you also have access to the meeting recordings. So through Microsoft Stream, you can look back, listen to the meeting, and actually search in the meeting as well. So if there are certain topics that you're most interested in, you can go back to the meeting, search for that topic, and the stream will actually take you to that to that part. Forrest has conducted a research in which they say that if you use Teams in the most optimal way, your information workers will save over four hours of productivity a week. Multiply that by the amount of employees that you have and the money that they make an hour, so you can see what the advantage is. And it's not only from a financial perspective. It's also from the hours that they actually get back to focus on what's most important for you as a company. And it's regardless of which device they work on or which OS they work on. And I think this is where the sharp device comes in. Uh, to talk a little about a little, a little bit more about this, let me hand over to Warren and Redmond to talk about these collab collaboration displays. All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so once again, my name is Warren Fernandez, and I'm here today to talk to you about Windows collaboration displays, and more specifically, how do we drive productivity in the modern workplace? So before we get into the device itself, let's take a moment to think about the rapidly evolving and growing modern workplace landscape. You're seeing more than 60 million meeting rooms, more than 180 million offices and open spaces. And of the meetings that occur in those spaces, 54% of them have remote participants. The number of employees that are working remotely, either part-time or full-time, is increasing rapidly. We project upwards of 72% this year alone. That's going to be driving tremendous volumes of video conferencing activity with more than 8 billion online meeting minutes scheduled per day. Now, the collaboration solution landscape itself is complex. 62% of businesses are using three or more different solutions simultaneously, which can lead to system inefficiencies, user confusion, or other technical challenges. And as such, we find that on average, meetings can start up to 12 minutes late due to one kind of problem or another. So, the opportunity that Microsoft and Sharp jointly recognized was the potential for one solution to drive better meetings and better room utilization, and we call that solution the Windows Collaboration Display. Next slide. Okay, so Microsoft's vision for collaboration, what does it mean? Uh, quite simply, it's unlocking the productivity of users with Teams, Office 365, and Windows 10 realized through a portfolio of intelligent edge devices that make meetings smarter via Microsoft Cloud Platform and AI solutions. Now you're going to see some of the Microsoft solutions summarized across the slide, such as Teams, Office 365, Windows 10, Microsoft Whiteboard, Cortana, and more. And these solutions apply across a range of spaces whether those are individual workspaces at home, on the go, or in a private office, or group workspaces such as huddle spaces, communal areas, and small, medium, and large meeting rooms. Below that, you're going to see a family of partner devices such as those from Sharp that then tie into Microsoft's Azure platform and the various assets that it can provide, such as IoT Edge and cognitive services. This collective group of solutions, devices, platforms, is how we see the collaboration vision evolving. Now, the opportunity itself, quite simply, it's massive. We see more than 200 million workspaces that we believe are ripe for disruption across a range of meeting room sizes. Large meeting rooms, huddle rooms, as I remarked earlier, classrooms in the educational environment, and the biggest opportunity, which is open layout and modern workplace spaces. The addressable markets are large, I want to highlight once again, 180 million plus in the open layout environment alone, and yet the penetration rates are very, very small. As such, there's an opportunity here for solution providers and device providers such as Sharp to offer new opportunities, new solutions to your users and customers in these spaces. Next slide. As such, Microsoft, we're very excited today to be working with Sharp and this is a partnership that has honestly been extending now for quite some time, and it's been a deep co-engineering engagement to deliver the world's first certified Windows collaboration display to market. The Windows collaboration display from Sharp is going to empower businesses to have more productive meetings. 
So I'd like to pause and think about three value propositions for the Windows Collaboration Display. These were some of the things that motivated us when Microsoft first envisioned this concept and reached out to Sharp to help bring it to market and realize it. The first is connect with ease. The second, collaborate at room scale. The third, make your spaces smarter. Now what do each of these mean? First, connect with ease. You heard me remark earlier that due to a number of different technical challenges, user unfamiliarity with the, with the UI, meetings can start delayed five minutes, seven minutes, nine minutes, upwards of 12 minutes in some occasions. As such, we want to see meetings get started faster with Windows Collaboration Displays. They are simple and intuitive to use, and yet actually very, very powerful. They connect seamlessly to any device, so a user can quite literally walk in, plug in, and be instantly productive on the big screen in the room. Collaborating at room scale, this ties in. So, take your Windows Collaboration Display and have it extend the use of your familiar device, whether it's your Windows 10 PC, your tablet, or perhaps your smartphone. It's your device with your content, your apps, and your UI that you already know how to use. And Windows Collaboration Displays will very seamlessly and smoothly extend that to the largest screen in the room. By doing so, you're transforming an ordinary space into a modern collaboration space. The powerful combination of Office 365 and the other robust tools on your PC Plus, once again, the audio, video, touch, and inking capabilities of the Windows Collaboration Display are going to give your users maximum flexibility to engage creatively with your team, whether they're in the room there locally or around the globe as we're doing here today. So finally, the third area, make your spaces smarter. This one's particularly exciting, I think, for the large format display ecosystem. Windows Collaboration Displays feature built-in IoT sensors that connect through to Microsoft Azure. These sensors will securely collect data and allow users, building owners, facility operators to gain insights and save money by optimizing the use of their space and operations. And when you combine that with the power of Microsoft Teams to create a digital hub for teamwork to make your meetings more efficient and productive, you have collectively an incredibly powerful and yet once again simple and intuitive solution. Next slide. So in summary, Windows Collaboration Displays from Sharp. It is a high resolution, multi-touch and ink enabled display with integrated stereo speakers and a high resolution camera that has been certified and optimized by Microsoft to facilitate excellent best-in-class video conference collaboration experiences. This product has been designed from the ground up to give your users the optimal Microsoft Teams experience. And I'd like to pass it back to Michelle at this point. Thanks so much, Warren. All the way from Redmond, uh, USA. As we conclude this first part, I really want to emphasize something that I said in my introduction. It's not so much about which piece of technology you buy. It's not about how you implement it. It's about what you're actually going to do with it. Today, right now, you have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. Think about that. That's what technology really is. It's possibility, it's adaptability, it's capability. But in the end, it's only a tool. What's a hammer without a person who swings it? It's not about what technology can do, it's about what you can do with it. You're the voice, and it's the microphone. When you're the artist, it's the paintbrush. We are living in the future we've always dreamed of. We have mixed reality that changes how we see the world in AI empowering us to change the world we see. You have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. So here's the question. What will you do with it? Now I would like to introduce you to our special guest and also our keynote speaker, Dr. Nigel Osland, who is an environmental psychologist. And he has been doing research, 11 years of research really, about the well-being of people at the workplace and how to make them 
more productive and make that performance better. So, Dr. Osler, please. Thank you, Bergus. So, as Bergus says, um, I'm a psychologist, probably one of the only psychologists here today, I imagine. Uh, I'm not a technologist, although I have to say, my very first paper, my very first published paper, was on computer human interaction. And uh, I did actually do computer science at university, and I thought, I don't understand it, I'm going into people, <laughs> which are far more complex. Anyway, so today I'm here to share some knowledge with you about how we create a perfect environment for successful meetings. I spent 11 years studying the impact of environmental conditions on comfort and performance. And after 11 years of being locked away doing that kind of research, I thought I've got to go out into the real world and tell people what I've found. So I'm going to share some of that knowledge with you today. Firstly, a question. How many of you spend more than 20% of your working week in meetings? Keep your hands up if it's more than 40%. Got a few. How are we doing in the other countries? Hands up if it's more than 60%. Oh, it could be the winner. We've got a couple more than 60%. percent you are not alone. We spend so much time in meetings. I've carried out three studies recently. In every study, we ask people how much time they spent in meetings. On average, it was 20% plus or minus 15%. That's one whole day a week in meetings. And the more senior you are, the more time you spend in meetings. It goes up to 60 even 80 percent for maybe a, the average IT professional that's something like 10,000 euros upwards per year of your time is spent in meetings plus all the lost opportunities so meetings are really important in terms of getting them right right second question <laughs> be honest hands up if you've ever nodded off in a meeting have we got any honest people, sufficiently honest people? Okay, I won't push that one. <laughs> we asked it in our survey, and I was amazed to find that 86% of our respondents, a thousand respondents, 86% of them said at some point they had nodded off in a meeting or certainly lost concentration. And we also asked people whether you thought your meetings were successful, because otherwise what's the point? And only about half of the meetings are successful. So we seem to be spending a lot of time in meetings and they don't seem to be very productive to, to my mind. So really important that we get meetings right. Now what affects a meeting and whether it's successful or not? And obviously the content, the speaker, hopefully they're not too boring. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but certainly the people, that's an important element of it. It's also about how you manage the meeting, how you chair the meeting. How do how you, how you administer it in terms of like just making sure there's a good agenda, good actions? Like I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes don't go to the meeting if it's not relevant to you. Why go there and sit there thinking, why did I bother sitting here for two or three hours? So, you know, choose your meetings. But it's all about how you manage them. As I said, it's about the people. Have they got the right knowledge? Are they going to share something new for you? Are you going to gain something from that meeting? And then there's the kind of world that I'm more interested in. First of all, the facilities. Is the meeting room laid out properly? This, in this scenario, I'm imparting knowledge, so we're in this kind of didactic situation where I'm doing knowledge. But you see around you, there's other alternative layouts. We could be in a more amphitheater situation, round tables and so on. So how do you lay out the meeting? And then there's the indoor environment itself. Now, temperature, lighting, air quality, noise, all affect how we perform either in the office or in meetings. Even noise to some extent, but that tends to be more external noise. I think the most important of all those variables is indoor air quality, and in particular CO2, carbon, carbon dioxide. This is just something from my students. I should say, I, from my students, I also lecture to master's students at UCL in London. And this is just a chart that one of my students produced from an experiment they did. Um, just a small, small experiment. And you can see in this chart, it's one of our university meeting rooms. As soon as people entered that room, the CO2 levels increased to <laughs> ridiculous levels. Now, the, CO, sorry, the WHO, World Health Organization, say that typical outdoor environment, you expect 300 to about 600 parts per million, PPM of CO2. Of CO2. 
In the offices, we're kind of hoping to keep it below 1,000 parts per million. If it goes above 1,000, you're starting to induce drowsiness. People are going to start losing concentration. They're going to nod off. When it gets above 2,000, they're starting to experience headaches and other symptoms. This one went up to 2,700. And that is not uncommon in, in my experience. Going into meeting rooms, particularly ones that are overutilized, overoccupied, so maybe occupancy sensors are useful, but particularly meetings that are overoccupied and ones that have poor ventilation, poor air quality, poor pressure ventilation, those are the ones that are going to cause problems. I'll come back to CO2. Because it's not only my students, there's lots and lots of evidence out there that shows the impact of environmental conditions on our performance, on our productivity. I think most of you, but hands up, we'll do hands up, I like that. Uh, have you heard of the Leesman survey or the Leesman index? Okay, uh, well maybe it's more my world. <laughs> but, but in the workplace, I mean, in the workplace industry, um, this is a common tool. It's a, it's a workplace feedback survey and they've conducted it in over 4,700 buildings across the world with, you can see, uh, 700,000 responses. And all I've done here, I've taken all that data, it's not my data, it's, it's a friend, Jim Altman, he's who uses data. I've taken all that data and I've just plotted, as you can see, the percentage of importance of different environmental factors and also the satisfaction levels. And you can see in that bottom right that the variables that we consider important, all the occupants and all those workspaces, and the variables that they consider the causes of dissatisfaction are temperature, noise, air quality. Light's considered very important, but we seem to be faring a little bit better with light. So even when we just look at satisfaction, the importance, you can see how relevant the indoor environment is to people's perception of how well their workplace is performing. Again, a different, different perspective. Many years ago, I carried out a meta-analysis of over 200 studies. And within those 200 papers, we found, we found 75 papers that quantified the impact of the environmental conditions on people's performance. Now, we, we weighted the results because there were some ridiculous findings. People were saying things like, oh, the, the, the noise in this space is going to uh, you know, increase your productivity by 160%. And so we kind of didn't believe a lot of that. But what we did is we weighted those studies for how, where they were, where they were conducted, and what they were, what they were measuring. So, if they conducted the study in a real world office rather than laboratory, higher weighting. If they conducted, the, if they measured embedded business metrics, so fee earning income, product, uh, profitability, those kind of metrics, then we gave it a higher weighting. And you can see that when you look at that, all of those, the combination of temperature, lighting, and air quality, good temperature, good lighting, good air quality, can improve your performance by about two and a half percent. And you're saying, two and a half percent? What's the point? Well, the, problem, the point is, is that in an organization, people are the most expensive bit of it. And if you can improve your performance of all your people by just five percent, it actually pays for your building for the year on average, typical. So 2.5%, it's worth fighting for, it's worth getting that right. So this, this, was, this was a study of looking at those parameters across office spaces. But actually, the variables they use are all relevant to meetings as well. And what I found incredible is that in most 200 studies and research I've done recently for Sean, there's very few studies that have looked at the direct impact in meeting rooms. And it seems ridiculous to me, we're spending all this time in meeting rooms, and, and you know, the outcomes of those meetings can be crucial to your business, and yet we aren't really fully understanding the impact. But as I said, the research that's out there, that looks at offices in general, is quite relevant to us. So I'm going to go through each factor, just uh, quickly for you, one by one. As, I, as I've already said, I think for me the most important one is, in, is in indoor air quality, and CO2 is a good measure. <coughs> What we do in this industry is quite complicated. There are lots and lots of different variables that affect our performance. But there was a lovely study done by Helsinki University where they did a meta-analysis of 24 good, good papers. 
and they've basically dumped it down for us all. So we can take something away. If you ever speak to researchers, they don't like this kind of data because it's too simple for them. But for us, it's actually really useful. Anyway, so what you can see here is, on, on this chart in particular, what they found is that if you increase the ventilation rate, the fresh air ventilation rate, above the standard, the building standards, 10 litres per second per person, which is what most buildings are built to, but for every three litres per second that you increase that fresh air by, you get an extra 1% in productivity. And the World Green Building Council reckon it's more like 11% gain in productivity performance, uh, up to a limit, obviously it plateaus at some point. So you want to keep your CO2 below 1,000 ppm, otherwise you're going to cause drowsiness, loss of concentration, demotivation and so on. And if you get your CO2 right, the chances are that you're also flushing out other, uh, other pollutants like volatile organic compounds we have seen. And by the way, the biggest polluter in a building is us. <laughs> We're the ones that produce all that CO2. Human beings, yeah, we're the polluters. So but if we can control our pollution, all that hot air, we can, we can also control uh, all the other pollutants in the building. I love this study in particular, this study by Saltish, uh, this is the Arabian researchers actually, and they, they, uh, they looked at 24 people, they put them in a simulated office, and they got them to do this strategic management um, scenario. And what they found is, uh, they exposed them to different uh, levels of CO2. And what they found is that if you expose them to 2,500 ppm, their decision making goes down, their, their ability to innovate goes down, their initiative goes down, their basic strategy. So, and if you're in a high power meeting, that's the stuff you want, isn't it? So let's get it right. My PhD was actually on thermal comfort. So I could speak to you for another three hours on this subject, I won't. Um, the only person who finds it that interesting. So, in short, right. So thermal comfort, yes, of course, temperature affects how comfortably, how comfortably we are thermally, but there are other variables as well. Humidity and air velocity. So as air velocity, think of wind chill factor. If you're out in the moors walking, if it's windy, you feel the cold more. Humidity, we prefer a dry heat, don't we, to a wet heat. So these, these physical variables affect our uh, thermal comfort. There's two more personal variables, which is uh, clothing, what we wear, and our metabolism or activity levels. So if you're in a meeting, if you're in quite a formal meeting and people are wearing suits, they're going to want the temperature slightly lower to people who are more casually dressed. Particularly some of those researchers I deal with are in shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. So you know, what, what we wear determines the right level of temperature from meeting space. And likewise, the activity does as well. If you're standing, if you're in, a, in an informal kind of uh, work workshop, if you're presenting, your metabolism is higher. You need to prefer a lower temperature to someone who's maybe been sat in a board meeting for three hours. Their temperature's going to drop. So what we do affects, affects the temperatures we require. And typically, the comfort level is about 20 to 25. Put it a bit better. So back to our Helsinki researchers who've summarized it nicely for us. And so you can see here that what they found is that once the temperature goes below the comfort level, goes below it, your performance drops by about 2%. And they're saying if you're exposed to higher temperatures than your comfort level, your performance drops by about 1.5%. Berkeley University did their own study, another big study, and they actually found that if, if you're um, if the temperature goes below your comfort level below 21 degrees C in that case, it drops by 4.7% and above by 2%. So this, relative to that thing I said about you only need a 5% gain to get your pay for your building, these are quite big numbers if they're sustained across uh, your whole of your business and across all the working time. There was another study um, that I liked. Um, actually, this was a Lithuanian study. And, um, they found that if you're in a meeting space, if you inject a little bit of cold air, it actually increases your performance by 4%. So what they're saying is if you're having a long meeting and it's getting a bit hot and stuffy in there, flush it out, cold air, then you kind of wake up again and they start to focus. Well, so that's quite a nice one, and something I might start doing at my own meetings. And then there's lighting, of course. Now, lighting uh, is, is different to the other variables, but certainly, yeah, but it's too dark, you can't read. 
and um, that certainly would affect productivity in the office or in a meeting. But also, it's, um, what, we've, what we also know is that the lighting levels that are required are slightly different for whether you're doing reading-based work or whether you're doing screen-based work. So now in offices, depending on the nature of the work, we might have slightly different lighting levels to reflect that. But think about your meetings. Are you doing mostly paper-based or screen-based work? What is the appropriate level of lighting for you to be productive? And this one I like in particular. This is just a chart showing how daylight, light on the blue spectrum in particular, how it affects our, uh, our, our neurotransmitters, our hormones. So basically what daylight does is it increases cortisol Cortisol is sometimes called as the, uh, the, the stress hormone because cortisol is what gets you ready for action. It's a bit like adrenaline, but not quite. But cortisol gets you ready for action. So daylight in the morning comes through the windows and you're ready to go. That's what it does. It wakes the body up, gets us ready for action. Whereas nighttime increases our levels of melatonin, and it's the melatonin that tells us it's time to go to sleep and time to chill. So you can imagine if you're in a meeting room and there's not a lot of daylight. Maybe that's why people nod off. That's another reason. So they're nodding off, not because I'm boring them, or <laughs> your speakers are boring. They're nodding off because there's lots of CO2, there's no daylight, the temperature's incorrect. So just bear that in mind when you design your meeting rooms and, uh, and so on. And uh, again, the World Green Building Council said if you don't get daylight right, it can have a 15% uh, negative impact on the performance. So in conclusion, um, hopefully I'll proven to you, I've shown to you that environmental conditions certainly affect performance, both in the office and in meeting spaces. Those requirements do depend on the activities. So in order to understand whether we've got the appropriate environmental conditions to match the activity, I do believe that we need to monitor them and ensure that the conditions are optimal. Thank you. Thank you. 
be, I mean, it could be the boardrooms, it could be training rooms, maybe huddle spaces, uh, areas where you just have a normal meeting. Um, and here, people coming together, sharing information, making decisions, maybe being creative, coming up with ideas. And we want to make sure that those, that time together, that collaboration of time together, is effective as possible. And Nigel told us, with the right temperature, with the right, like, right writing, and indeed air quality, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, we know that when a good meeting takes place, a lot of people have already achieved good work. Um, I'm thinking here primarily of facilities managers, facility managers. Yeah. They provided the services, the space, uh, made sure that the meeting room is well fitted out, and they will be totally in love with this data. Uh, temperature, brightness, air quality, occupancy, uh, humidity. All that data flowing up into the Azure Cloud being made available. And you know, facilities management, if they're doing their job properly, will want that data and make sure that their meeting room spaces, which they are providing, their job to provide, is um, working as effectively as possible. So facilities management, very much a target for workspaces, maybe even uh, human resources. Um, they should be all to be interested in the KPIs, the metrics of how people are working. So um, they're really interested to make sure that that data Know, working out is it good for employees. And finally, people who are interested in meeting spaces are the people who work in there. Me, you, anytime we have a meeting, we want to be comfortable. We don't want to be thinking about the temperature, about the brightness open the window. You know, we've got content, we've got information which we want to focus on, and that really needs to be um, our understanding that it's where we're in that meeting for work and not to be left in technology there as an enabler, the workspace is really making sure we focus on the content and make the right decisions. So we know the audiences with smart spaces. Let's just move on and uh, I'll just show how this is all working um, within, let's say, the whole IoT cloud-based uh, ecosystem. So our Windows collaboration display is collecting all that data and sending it directly through a straightforward internet connection into the cloud. There it's stored. Maybe it cleans up a little bit to check for errors. Uh, maybe we can also apply some AI, some trends which may be um, generated out of that. But you know, having data stored is one thing, being able to use it is another. And this is where we have the workspaces or perhaps the workspaces dashboard, so which will be running uh, on the PC, of particular interest maybe to the facilities management. They can get to see the trends, they can see what's happening in those meeting rooms, what the environment. So a fairly straightforward understanding of an IoT cloud-based uh, ecosystem. You know, that's how our workspace is very much in partnership with Microsoft on the Azure Cloud platform. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we're seeing is that we've got a very headline, top-line understanding of workspaces. It's a dashboard, it's bringing in lots of data, it's measuring meeting rooms, all those kinds of metrics. So good understanding. But now this is a chance also to see the power of teams and also with a collaboration display in action. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes now in collaboration. So you know, I've got my experience with workspaces, but the guys in Madrid, in Amsterdam, they've also been working with workspaces and we really want to work with them now to get a little bit more detail and understanding, more concrete understanding what is it about workspaces which is giving really us benefit. So, I'm um, going to go to um, Ronald first in Amsterdam. Are you there, Ronald? Yes, Chris, I'm there, I'm there. Excellent. So, um, yeah. uh, if you go, Ronald, I'm just, just going to say, yeah, we set up um, the, the dashboard here from workspaces, and Ronald's going to tell us a little bit more about you know, what we can get out of the temperature readings. Yes, Chris, so uh, what workspaces does for us is uh, uh, gives us insight into uh, the things measured by the sensors. Uh, for example, here you can see a graph where you can see the temperature over time. Um, and uh, it also can give you alerts. Um, so for example, if uh, temperature drops, uh, and let's for example take this uh, Thursday uh, morning, uh, you see that the uh, temperature was very low. Uh, and I was meeting uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, with temperature that low, even below 80 degrees, uh, we have learned from Dr. Osmond 
that this is not the right uh, condition to have an effective meeting. That's right, yeah. I mean, what, what I can see is, um, you know, you've got the inside and the outside temperatures, so sort of holiday, uh, probably the nice part of the energy sector, but it's the outside So, yeah, sure, you need to have a good temperature, comfortable meeting space. So what would you do, and what happens <coughs> if you get that sudden uh, temperature crash? Yes, in this particular case, it was a, a, a wintry evening, so across that night, temperature dropped in that room. Uh, but we can't, because we can connect our uh, Office 365 calendar of that room to workspaces, uh, we could know there was a meeting at 8 o'clock. So the heating system could have uh, gotten that alert and already start heating that room earlier. So if we would arrive in that room, uh, it would have been a, a, a cozy room to start a meeting in with the right temperature. Um, and it's not only temperature that we get insights in, it's also air quality, uh, for example. That if um, um, we measure, uh, for example, CO2 levels, which you see in this graph, and, and I think we all remember, although uh, we all know, being in meetings, probably towards the end of the day, with just too many people in the room, uh, meeting is staying long, and you can just tell by being in that meeting that it is not the ideal environment to have a proactive meeting uh, uh, to keep awake. And if CO2 levels start rising, uh, Dr. Oswald uh, told us that it can cause drowsiness, headaches, uh, we have difficulties concentrating. And we know for sure that is not giving us good meeting outcomes. Yeah, I can see that, Ronald. Um, a great graph there, so CO2, you can see Monday was particularly bad. I was just going to say, Ronald, well, if it's been one of your meetings, I don't think I would have felt drowsy or a lot of concentration. Um, but you know, Ronald, well, you've got this meeting, high CO2, so what are you going to do about it? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, what we could have done, uh, we just could have opened the window, uh, and we got the alert from the uh, workspaces software. Uh, we could have opened the window, let fresh air in, and uh, everybody uh, uh, would be, again, being proactively participating in this meeting. Uh, but at Sharp, we like to do these kind of things in a better and smarter way. So we like to work with HVAC partners who control the heating, the cooling and the ventilation in buildings to make sure that we do these kind of processes automatically. So if we know there is a booking in the calendar at a certain time, then we will be checked what's the actual room temperature, what's the conditions in the room, and make sure that these systems automatically ensure the right room conditions for a perfect meeting. So that's how we like to do it, Chris. That's right, Ronald. Yeah. So me, just to emphasize, you know, having our workspaces dashboard is brilliant, uh, but we're also working with uh, HVAC facility management, um, air conditioning partners to get that data going directly into smart building systems. We'll take questions by the end. Excellent. So thank you very much, Ronald. Um, let's just move across now to Alfred in Madrid. So hola, Alfred, can you tell us? How workplaces have been helping you in your work? Hello, Chris. Hello. Good morning, New York. Yes, in terms of uh, how we could talk about the efficiency of the spaces. I think it's so important. And uh, using the work the spaces, we, the, it can offer us a very good uh, insight or information about how we are using our. Uh, Meeting room. So, in that case, we can look at uh, this uh, graphic. This called and a schedule, uh, schedule meetings. And then on this graphic, we can see this part on the dark color. And then this is what is called unscheduled meetings. Yeah. So that scheduled meeting means such kind of a, a meeting that were not booked in in the system. However due to the occupancy sensor that we have in our collaboration display. Uh, they found that some people was there, so then some kind of, of unbooked meetings, or we can say uh, informal meetings, was in, uh, we, in, our, in our office. So then this is, this is not necessarily a problem in our organization, but maybe we have to think about what kind of meetings are uh, realistic in our organization. So then maybe we have to think about to create or to change from more formal expensive to more informal or, 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 or have a room spaces. So then this is can help us about uh, the other protocols and behavior of our meeting. So this is then uh, 
two things. On one side, it's very uh, interesting to know how our organization is working, what is the style of the meetings in our organization, but on the other hand, it's very interesting in order to, to how to say, to understand the, the efficiency of our spaces, or in the fact, the efficiency of our square method, that you know that's a, uh, more and more, is more expensive in big cities. So then, this is then very interesting to, to, to look at the efficiency of such spaces using the work space application. Yeah, that's all, please. Thank you, Alfred. Indeed, yeah, yeah. let's so call that idea. You know, when it comes to workspaces and measuring environmental information, that is also linked and coordinated with room booking systems. Um, so you can measure, and then also with our system to see whether rooms are being used as they should be. And here, you know, facility management or human resources would be able to analyze this graph and understand, look, we need less formal meeting rooms, uh, maybe we can have more informal party spaces, more spontaneous meeting place. Right. Excellent, thank you, Alfred. Right, I think we can also come to New York. So, um, Mary, <coughs> I know you've been uh, inspecting and using, understanding Synapse workspaces. So, tell us about phantom meetings. Sounds pretty scary, but how scary is phantom meetings? Um, so phantom meetings, um, I would describe as you know, you are looking for a conference room and you're searching through and nothing's available, um, and then you walk by and somebody's in the space or not in the space. I book it, but I don't arrive. Maybe I have a recurring meeting every week, but I decide to cancel it or I don't. I leave it on the calendar, but I don't utilize it. So I'm claiming the space, but I'm not actually in it. So from a services standpoint, if there's a way to leverage that information for meeting room booking systems, um, I book the space, but after five minutes, nobody's in that space anymore. I can free it up for somebody else to take. So I think from a, a motion standpoint, there's some data analytics there that we could potentially use uh, as useful information. Thank you very much, um, Mary. So indeed, phantom meetings can be eliminated or at least to get more efficient usage and understanding of your meeting rooms. Um, Another area in which we've been investigating is this idea of people counting, and you know, we had questions here earlier about artificial intelligence. So, I mean, how do you see people counting working through with our workspaces? Um, so, this is my favorite. I mean, the AI camera is a unique capability to shark in the window collaboration play. And for me, I think it's, it's huge value for several reasons. But if you think about people investing in spaces and detection on people count, that's something that's very expensive. It's sensors that this is on an endpoint, it's right here, and that AI camera is going to facilitate potentially in the future, let's say end of the year, uh, the technology is there for us to leverage people count to be able to say, all right, I'm designing, maybe as an integrator, we've got a lot of you guys in the room, a 50,000 budget conference room, and it's for ideally 12 people. I'm using the data analytics to see, hey, my average meeting size is only four people. Did I really get a great ROI on that conference room? It's not being leveraged the way I thought it was. Let's consult and let our end users know, hey, maybe we want to do something different. Maybe we want more home spaces. Maybe let's open up our environment to do something different. So there's a lot of opportunities for, I would say, one-on-one -on -one consult about, especially with remote work. If you think about remote work initiatives, space planning is going to change dynamically in the next couple of years. We're going to see that stat 75%. That's really important data that people want to look and space plan for. Thank you very much, Mary. So indeed, you see the trends emerging with new workspaces and you, know, you make the adjustments and so forth for human resources and uh, facilities management. Lovely. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Ronald. Um, David, are you still there? Did that all come through okay? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was brilliant. And that let us understand workspace much better. And also, as a matter of fact, that, that brought collaboration to life actually what you just showed us because this this is how how it is in, in real life meetings and how you can work together across many different locations this brings us unfortunately already nearly at the end of our connected session we will all have time for a local session afterwards which is which is nice so another hour to go with us but before we go into that i like to take the opportunity uh, to say goodbye to our fellow staff in all the different locations and I'd like to start with Madrid. And yeah, Madrid what, what are your plans for after the connected part? Well, we have uh, more, uh, more meeting and we will touch 
uh, the monitor and of course the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will have that here as well in Amsterdam, so don't worry about that. And there will be time for questions, I'm sure, as well. So that is what we leave for the local part as well. Yeah, thank you very much to my friend.